Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I hope your audio is connected and that you can hear me speaking loud and clearly. We're going to throw some directions in the chat soon. Um, just to get you started, making sure that your fingers are warmed up and so that you can say hello to everyone, maybe share where you're joining from. That would be great. And it looks like we have Samantha joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to her. Thank you, Lofa. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Hopefully everything's working all right. You'll see Maureen Green in the chat there in case you have any issues. Um, as Lisa said, feel free to say hello, introduce yourself, where you're joining from, and we'll go ahead and get started. The webinar today is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the ATE community by offering trainings, cultivating a community of people who care about evaluation, researching emerging topics in ATE evaluation, and collecting data about the ATE program. One of the most frequent questions we get is, are the slides available? And yes, all of the materials from today's webinar, along with several other resources, are already posted on our website. You can download them by following the link on the right side of your screen. And the recording is going to be available within a couple of days. That will be emailed to you and will also be available on our website. So I am Samantha Hooker. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Megan Lopez and Lissa wilson Betcho will be our presenters today. They both work for Evaluate, which is located in the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We would also like to recognize the Evaluate team members who worked behind the scenes to bring today's webinar to you. There was quite a few. We had Kelly Robinson, Maureen Green, Val Marshall, Lori Wingate, Erica Sturgis, and Lee McClure. We would also like to thank Tiffany Shelfont and Diane Walter for their help in helping us uh, get this webinar ready for you today. Before we dive in, I do want to acknowledge that while we're funded by NSF, our views um, are not necessarily their views. We do not speak for them. So the content in this workshop will re reflect our views. And now I'll hand it over to Lisa. Thanks, Samantha. Well, Megan and I are really excited to be here with you all today. We have been thinking a lot about what it means to interpret data and what it means to come up with useful and actionable evaluation conclusions. So we're going to share with you our current thinking on the topic, but we also want to hear from you. So we have a number of question breaks throughout the webinar today. So make sure that you're ready to jump in, ask questions, share thoughts and ideas. Um, because we know that in our webinars, attendance, attendees get just as much from the other people in the chat box as they do from us. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and turn our cameras off for now so that we can focus on the slides, but we're going to turn the cameras back on when it comes to the question and answer sessions. All right. So to get us started, I want to paint a picture for you all about why interpretation of evaluation findings is important. So I once heard from Tomas Chianca, who is a Brazilian evaluator, that data points are like the many stars in the sky, and that it's the role of evaluation to connect those stars into a constellation that tell a story about a project. So constellations, they tell stories. They hold fables, lessons, and warnings. They're also crucial for wayfinding and navigation. So this constellation may be familiar to you. Um, it's typically called Orion the Hunter. And the three stars across Orion's belt are bright and really easy to locate in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you run a line between those three stars, they'll show you which way is east and west. So that star on the very right is actually called Mintanka, and it always rises due east and sets due west, no matter where you are on Earth. Such a valuable resource if you find yourself without your phone or GPS that we have nowadays. So similar to stargazing, where there are millions of stars in the sky, there are many possible indicators or data points that you could choose in your evaluation. But ultimately, a good evaluation pulls them together into a meaningful story that points the way for a project. 
evaluation conclusions can serve as a guide for where to go next. Just as constellations can guide you at night, evaluations can help you guide, help you navigate the project story. So one of the many reasons I love this analogy is because it recognizes that the same set of stars become different constellations to different people. So cultures will choose different stars in the same area and make different connections, bringing their own meaning. Each constellation is just as valid, just as true, just as useful. The same way that different projects could pull different indicators, draw different connections, and find different meanings. So while constellations are more of an art, evaluation is more like an argument. So I don't mean an argument like a defensive or aggressive argument, but a logical argument. So unlike drawing a constellation, the choices in an evaluation should be transparent and justifiable. You could almost draw it out in a formula like this. Evidence in combination with values leads to evaluative conclusions. Evaluations, they make an argument about the success or quality of a project. Conclusions can tell us how well did a project do? To what extent did it meet its objectives? Was that project successful? And when we say that these connections should be transparent and justifiable, we're asking questions about both the evidence that was used and the values that were included. So for the evidence, what kind of evidence, right? Who, from who was it collected? Was the collection legitimate? In the end, is this data trustworthy? And for the values, whose values were incorporated into the evaluation? At what points were they considered? The answers to all of these questions bolster the legitimacy of your argument. So we at Evaluate often break evaluation down into these four basic steps. Ask important questions, gather evidence, interpret that data to answer the evaluation questions, and report and use the evaluation conclusions for project improvement, accountability, and planning. So we need transparency and justification in all of these steps. Everything works together, but today we really wanna focus on the interpretation part. So this is really where the magic happens in evaluation. This is where the story is told, where a constellation is created and directions are given. So often I find myself as an evaluation practitioner really focusing on the first few steps, the evaluation design, collecting the data, really doing that analysis, but then I find myself at a point where I need to pull everything together into a report. I need to actually answer the evaluation questions that we set out at the beginning of the evaluation. And instead of just presenting analyzed data, evaluation should go that next step in comparing those findings to some sort of standard benchmark or expectation. So this is really what we mean by interpretation, not analysis, not reporting, but the things that happen between those two steps. So we chose the language of interpretation for this webinar, but we also know that people talk about it with words like meaning making or sense making. Sometimes they say target setting or even comparing to a benchmark. So really interpretation is this process that starts with the evaluation questions, right? And then from those questions, we collect evaluation data points. And then we ground these data points in some kinds of comparative data. And then that comparison turns those data into evaluative findings. Then we take the findings and combine them with values of those who are involved in the project in order to come to an evaluative conclusion. So when we say values, we mean beliefs around what is considered good or effective. And this process of transforming individual data points into evaluative conclusions is not always feasible or called for in practice, but it really will engage the utility of your evaluation. By connecting the constellation and telling the story, you'll find your evaluation findings are much more digestible and meaningful to the project staff, right? Your evaluation questions, they true, your evaluation conclusions, they truly answer the questions that were set out at the beginning of the evaluation. Evaluation conclusions, they should point a project in a direction of improvement or change, and the project staff should be able to navigate their context and challenges using the evaluation as a guide. 
So that's all great, but let's ground this in an example, right? What are we really talking about? Well, imagine a conversation between a project lead or PI and their evaluator. So the PI asks, how effective is this new virtual simulation lab curriculum? How, how, how effective has it been for improving student retention? So the PI, she needs to report to her dean regarding the new updates of her program curriculum. The evaluator's response, well, 58% of students remained enrolled in the program from last year to this year. Um, is that good? How should the PI really interpret that number? What story should she go tell her dean about this project? You know, this happens pretty often that evaluators provide reports that are essentially data dumps, just pages of data points and facts and figures without tying them together, without creating that constellation, the story of the project. What if instead the evaluator's response was, well, the new virtual lab simulations have been moderately effective in improving student retention. Well, now the PI has an answer to her question, the start of a story, and they can use the evaluation data to further justify how they reach that conclusion. So today we want to provide some tools and strategies for how to navigate this process of transforming evaluation data into meaningful conclusions that answer the evaluation questions. So in the rest of today's webinar, Megan and I are gonna start at the beginning of this process with what it means to ask an evaluative question. Then, then uh, provide ideas of where you might look for information to integrate comparative data into your interpretation. We wanna share some practical strategies and approaches to interpreting that data to making those evaluation conclusions. And finally, pull it all together and put it into action with a case example. So I do wanna pause here. I know we're in the very beginning, but I wanna pause to see if there are any questions. This can be kind of a different way of thinking about evaluation. So we wanna make sure that everyone is on the same page before we dive into some of the details. I'll turn the spotlight on. But does anyone have any questions at this point? I don't see any in the chat, but that doesn't mean it's rattling, not rattling around in some, okay. Okay, well, as a reminder, any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat throughout the, the webinar. We do have two more question breaks in which we can talk about them. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Megan. All right, thank you so much, Lissa, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, so returning to our evaluation process, we're going to go back to the very base of your evaluation, and those are the evaluation questions. To provide meaningful and actionable evaluation conclusions, we really have to start there. Evaluation questions identify what aspects of a project will be investigated. They're going to focus on the merit, worth, or significance of your project, and unlike survey questions, they're not intended to be answered by a single data point, but instead should be informed by a constellation of data that you're, you're building and putting together. And as they are set at the very beginning of the evaluation between the project and evaluation teams, evaluation questions will guide and scope the overall evaluation. But what makes a question evaluative? Well, it can be important to have descriptive questions like how many or how much or did this occur? These are not inherently evaluative. Instead, evaluative questions are more open-ended and will produce some kind of conclusion or finding that relate to the merit or significance of the project while also taking into account its context. So let's go back to our friends from the prior example where instead of asking, has student retention improved? the PI has the very thoughtful question of how effective is this new curriculum? Answering the question how effective is going to require a number of data points and not just one. Aside from knowing what percent of students remained enrolled this year, in this case it's 58%, it would be important to know how this compares to prior years. Our evaluator knows this and tells our PI that we can compare this 58% to 48 and 45% in the previous two years. So now we can see that there's been an increase in retention across time. 
But now that we know that, we might also want to know if this change is possibly related to changes in retention rates across the whole institution or something else. So to learn this, we could look at retention rates of other programs in the college and even similar programs across the country. For example, our evaluator shares, other programs in our college have a retention rate closer to 58%, and similar programs across the country have retention rates of 62% on average. So now that we've brought all of these data points together, we're beginning to build our evaluation finding, and that sets the stage for our constellation that will eventually lead to our conclusions. So earlier we said that evaluation data points are grounded in comparative data that will allow for meaningful evaluation findings. Next, we're going to look at what we mean by comparative data and where to find it. Now, before we get into using context to inform our conclusions, I want to talk about why this is useful. Often, grant-funded projects do not have the funds or opportunities to conduct any kind of quasi-experimental design, as tempting as that might sound and as interesting as the findings could be. This is particularly true in the NSF ATE program, where we can only devote so much time and financial resources to evaluation. Therefore, evaluation conclusions are unable to speak to any kind of causal questions. However, we can still produce sound and transparent evaluation findings by comparing our data to others. Today, we want to share four sources of where we can look to integrate comparative data to build your evaluation findings. These are performance targets, historical or baseline data, similar programs, and public data sets. For our evaluators that are here today, we hope that this list is a helpful reminder of where comparative data might come from. And for our project leads and grant professionals, we hope that you use this list to ask critical questions of your evaluators. And with that, let's take a look at each of these sources. And we're gonna start by looking at your project's performance targets and project goals. Performance targets and project goals assess a project's performance against what it planned to do or hopes to accomplish. Here, we're really thinking about your project's outputs, deliverables, and outcomes. I'm, I added an example of this from Evaluate's forthcoming five-year evaluation report. And I know it's small on screen, but on the left, we have listed our planned activities that we put in our original grant um, alongside the goals we had for those activities. The circle icons on the right indicate if the project goal was met, exceeded, or not met. This data might help us answer the question, how adequately did Evaluate provide services to the ATE community? If you're part of an ATE project evaluation, you might look for performance targets and project goals in your, your project's logic model where your intended activities, outputs, and outcomes were likely listed. Your AT proposal might have some intended goals, activities, and outcomes listed as well. And if your project involves any type of curriculum, for example, you could look at the learning objectives listed there. Finally, some projects are subject to um, some type of advisory committee who often has data and documents that relate to your project goals. So before we move on, I wanna take a moment and ask you all a question to consider and hopefully share your responses in the chat. What might be some concerns or considerations you would have if you only use this method and compared your evaluation data to performance targets or project goals? Please take a moment to think on it and, and share your responses in the chat. So any, anything that you might come to mind if this is, Goals might be lackluster, that's true. Something to think about, our goals are often developed very early on in your, well, almost always in your project's life cycle. Um, and that might mean, you know, we don't know where the, the information came from from the goals. Maybe someone else set those goals. Um, so that's a great point. You might not see the whole story, yes. So an example I bring up are logic models from 2019 or 2020, where a lot of great things were listed out. Um, and all that changed when the pandemic happened. The assumption, 
That's right. So our, we have to then think about our assumptions and the goals that, and whether or not they're appropriate and still relevant to the work by the time you're evaluating it. Targets might be arbitrary. Oh my goodness, there's so much um, great thoughts here. Thank you everyone for sharing. So I'm going to pivot and then offer a few more examples of where we can look for comparative data because often we don't want to use just one of these methods and all of everyone's comments in the chat really demonstrate why one single method might not be enough on its own. So let's look at using historical or baseline data to set comparison. As the name applies, this refers to the act of comparing project data at various intervals to make evaluative judgments. Often, this means comparing what was happening before, during, and after the project was implemented to one another. A common example of this is comparing pretest data to post-test data after a new training module was delivered. Historical or baseline data for AT projects might be found in your proposal project description if you used any type of baseline data to justify need or intended outputs for your project. Another great source might be your institutional research or grants management offices. Often these offices in your institutions have collected or reported on various types of student demographic, enrollment or retention, or any other type of data over time that you could use to inform your evaluative findings. Industry associations, if you're working with one, might be another place to look for relevant historical data. Our third category is comparisons to similar programs. We can use similar programs to compare our data with that of another program doing similar work or attempting to achieve like, likewise outcomes. If, for example, we implemented a new educational curriculum, we could look at the number of credentials earned by students at the end of one year and compare that to the number of students who received the same credential at another institution with a similar program, but not a new curriculum. And to find similar programs, we could start by checking out Evaluate's ATE survey report to look for similar programs to which ours could be compared to. ATE Central also hosts archives of past ATE projects. And if you're not involved in ATE, or if you are, um, you likely put in a lot of research to develop your project um, and you might have come across a research article or publication that shares um, outcomes or goals of a similar program. And finally, we're going to discuss how public data sets can be a valuable source of comparative data. This approach compares your project data against a standardized um, or against standardized data collected on a generalizable landscape. Here I pulled an example from the STEM push network that shows the percent of BIPOC high school STEM students who persisted in STEM for one full year of college. We can use that number to compare to our own project to inform ev evaluative judgments. There are a few places where we can access this data that are particularly relevant for ATE projects. For example, the National Center for Education Statistics collects and publishes data related to US education. In ATE, the NSF Includes Shared Measures Initiative collects outcomes data that aims to broaden STEM participation. And the Community College Research Center collects and publishes data related to student enrollment, retention, and other outcomes. And finally, you might also find a discipline-specific research article or publication that shares national or generalizable data. Okay, so we just went through the various forms of comparative data that we can use to inform our evaluative findings. Here you can see the list again. In a moment, we're going to have a question break, and then I will pass it off to Lissa, who will talk about strategies we can use to transform our findings into meaningful evaluation conclusions. But first, I wanted to take a quick poll to see whether you use these kinds of comparative data when interpreting evaluation data in your work. Samantha, oh, it looks like she already launched the poll. Thanks so much. Um, I hope you can see the poll question on the right of your screen that asks which of these 
types of comparative data do you use or maybe see most often in evaluations? Are they performance targets most often, historical or baseline? We have some answers coming in. That's great. I'm going to give it just a moment. Oh, wow. So we're seeing a lot of performance targets. This is one that's often readily available, so that, that finding doesn't totally surprise me. All right, it looks like our answers are slowing down. So you have just over half most often, or they, they commonly use performance targets. And then historical or baseline data seems to be used quite a bit as well. Um, and again, we're more so looking at our own data that we have readily available to us. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, um, for participating. Samantha, I'm going to hand it over to you to see what kind of questions have popped up in the chat. We do have a couple of questions. Okay, so first up, can secondary data act as comparative data? Yes, absolutely. So a lot of the, this data, especially those that might be coming from external to your institution, um, that will all be considered secondary data. So there are lots of great important forms um, of secondary data that you can bring in. Something to consider when, when thinking about this is how was that data collected? How does the group or the entity that you're comparing it to um, relate or how is it similar or different to our own? Um, and, you know, sometimes that might be a limitation and something to consider and address as you're developing your findings, um, but just important things to think about. Okay, thank you. And how can an evaluator calibrate their judgment, i.e. what is success or moderate success? All right, Michael, thank you. That's a really great question, and it perfectly will set us up for um, what Liz is about to talk about in the next section. So I'm going to pause on that, and if we have any further questions, we'll address it after her question or after, during her question break. Okay, and it looks like we are all set for now. All right, that's a great transition. You know, before we <clears throat> transition out of this question break, I, I just want to add like what I really love about this, this list of different places, different sources that you can go to find comparative data is, as an evaluator it is so easy, right? Those program targets are normally always there, right? And people want to know how uh, outcomes really compare to them. But as you all listed, sometimes those aren't the best way to make the most meaningful conclusions. And so having this checklist to go back and say, oh, right, I should look at public data sets or what could be a similar program, right? What is that? Um, so for me, I find it such a really a helpful reminder to, to, to see what else is out there. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on. So now that we have collected the various data points that will make up the stars in our constellation, let's talk about tying them all together. So Megan talked us through what it looks like to ask evaluative questions and add meaning to your data points by integrating that comparative data. Now let's look at the next step of this progress of this process, which is integrating people's beliefs about what is considered good to turn our evaluation findings into evaluation conclusions. You know, we briefly said this before, but not every evaluation takes this last step, right? Not every evaluation comes to an evaluative judgment about how well a project is doing. But what we wanna to do today is challenge you to think a bit differently about how you might do this in your own work and about how or whether taking this extra step can really make evaluation reports just that much more meaningful and useful to projects. So we know that the process of um, making these kinds of judgments, of, of taking evaluation findings and combining them with values is an inherently human process. And while we want our conclusions to be transparent and justified, at the end of the day, this really is a determination, a judgment that mixes those findings with our values. So sometimes this process is 
this process of critical thinking happens solely with the evaluator or the evaluation team. However, the values and perspectives of that evaluation team, they may not encompass those of the project or those that the project serves. So more often, we see a collaborative effort between the evaluation team and the project team. So through the relationship that they have built while working together, they come to a shared understanding of what project success looks like. So I think this, this starts to talk about Michael's question of how do you calibrate what is success, right? And so a lot of times that calibration is, is done fairly informally in these kinds of uh, regular meetings and conversations between the evaluation team and the project team. But there are times when you might want to go further and involve other consumers of the evaluation outside of the project team. So this might include people who are being served by the project, like students or faculty. This might be college administrators or even business and industry partners if you are involved in an ATE project. But at the end of the day, we want our evaluation conclusions to be perceived as trustworthy. And it can be beneficial to integrate a variety of beliefs, concerns, and viewpoints into this interpretation process. So when multiple voices are involved, we typically describe this as engagement through participatory sense-making sessions. So this phrase, engagement uh, of participatory sessions, right? So this is an overarching label for a collaborative process where people jointly make sense of information and develop a shared understanding. It recognizes that humans make meaning through complex pathways that involves debate and discussion with others. In following with democratic ideals, these strategies aim to create a space for dialogue and discussion among people who are involved with the project on multiple levels, whether they're participants in the project, project staff, administrators or leaders, or even funders. So these, then these sense-making sessions can be bounded as critical conversations between the evaluation team and the project team or large events that involve dozens of people. What really matters is the types of questions that you're asking during these sessions. So here are some examples of questions that can help you structure these meaning-making, sense-making discussions. So you could ask open-ended questions, starting off with, what is the data telling you, right? Does it align with your expectations? So this can really help you see the evaluation findings through a variety of lenses. You can ask questions that compare the findings to um, expectations, right? Is this better or worse than you expected? Or just straight out say, is this good? Is this good enough, right? Those direct questions really start to surface assumptions around uh, what they thought was going to happen and bring to the surface those values of what they think is good enough. Asking questions like, what really stands out for you? Or are there any surprises here? This really can highlight outliers in the data or findings that are in contrast with any original assumptions participants held. And finally, asking questions about what action can be taken because of the findings. Questions like, what response do you think is required here? Or what should the project do based on this information? It can really jumpstart that action planning that can happen as a result of evaluation findings, really facilitate that use of evaluation findings. So while these questions can be discussed in a meeting, a virtual or an in-person meeting, you can also think about shaking things up and having a data party. So a data party is an organized event in which evaluation findings are shared, discussed, and interpreted. So I know that I'm always trying to share evaluation and data with others in a way that's fun and exciting. A data party can be a really great way to engage people who might be hesitant about evaluation or data. And yes, this photo on the slide is of the Evaluate team wearing party hats at the most recent ATEPI conference presenting some ATE survey results. And you know, you will not be surprised to know that we had noisemakers and hats for the audience to join in the party as well. So data parties can include a variety of different activities. 
right? So these might include a gallery walk where findings are posted around the wall and participants uh, move from poster to poster, adding to the discussion. It could be a world cafe in which small groups start to brainstorm and then they share um, their thoughts and findings with a large group. You can use data dashboards to really facilitate conversations around uh, information. Dotmocracy is another way to go about it, using dot stickers to have people respond or vote, right, like democracy, on questions, um, or virtual whiteboards. Really being creative, I think, is the point here to immerse participants in interpreting the evaluation findings. So a few years ago, my colleague Kelly Roberts and I, we printed these mural size posters with evaluation findings and reflection questions. And we hung them on the wall of the office of our client. And uh, families who were involved with this program, they walked around, they discussed the findings, um, they wrote responses on sticky notes. And you could see here in the conclusions, right? We kind of had them say like, to what extent do you agree or disagree with these draft conclusions? And this was such a great way to get people meaningfully engaged in digesting the information and then applying meaning to those evaluation findings. So there are a number of benefits if you decide to use a participatory sense-making session in your evaluation. So first, engaging people in the interpretation process will increase buy-in and understanding of the evaluation conclusions. This kind of process also encourages double loop learning, where participants have a chance to reflect on their assumptions and actions based on the result. Evaluation conclusions have a better chance of affecting sustainable change when this kind of double loop learning happens. And these participatory strategies are inherently democratic and increase the inclusiveness of the interpretation process. Before using this strategy, you want to pause and carefully consider who is involved in this process. It's important to have representation from all voices in the room, particularly those that are typically excluded. Sense-making sessions can be resource intensive, both for the evaluation team to plan them, but also you have to take into consideration the time um, commitment of those who are going to participate. These discussions, um, can also really heavily rely on having that critical facilitator in the room, someone who can ask difficult questions and who is wary of the conversation, only confirming the biases that people had when they entered the room. Finally, sense-making sessions that engage large groups of people can sometimes be difficult to systematically document. But I wanna remind you, in the beginning, we talked about who is involved in this, right? I think that these sense-making sessions can be um, scoped up and down depending on your resources, your context, and the need for your evaluation. So another interpretation strategy is the creation of evaluative rubrics. So we just mentioned that the participatory sense-making sessions can sometimes be difficult to document, making your conclusions a little bit less transparent. One of the great strengths of a rubric is the transparency of how conclusions were determined. So you're all most likely familiar with the general concept of a rubric. So most often we find rubrics used for grading. Like a grading rubric, an evaluative rubric provides a framework that describes what performance looks like at each level. Importantly for evaluation, it can really help to make the important stuff measurable. It can deliver clear reasoned answers and give a voice to values. So often what's easily measured isn't always captured, uh, doesn't always capture what is truly important. Um, and important outcomes can seem intangible or feel nebulous. Rubrics can help you operationalize what good really looks like or what good enough looks like. Instead of simple targets where uh, the standard met is good or unmet is bad, rubrics allow you to look at the gradient of progress. The development of a rubric is often a collaborative effort with a variety of people involved in the project. Similar to before, the involvement of many voices allows people's values to come front and center in defining what is good enough. So not only do rubrics allow values to be integrated into the conclusions, but included, including the scoring rubric in the appendix of the evaluation 
also makes those values explicit and the evaluative reasoning transparent to an outside audience. So a primary benefit of using rubrics to develop evaluative conclusions is the level of transparency it provides. So it allows an evaluator to give a summarized conclusion that answers the evaluation question with evidence to back up that conclusion clearly and organized. This allows you to say the project is working well or the project exceeded expectations, conclusions that are meaningful to project leaders and funders. Rubrics allow you to easily weave together findings from quantitative and qualitative data. So we know that evaluations with both numbers and stories are typically more powerful. And the ability to pull these together to form a single conclusion is a strength of using a rubric. While using the rubric might be the easy part, developing that rubric can sometimes be more difficult. So as with the participatory sense-making sessions, it's important to consider who is involved in developing the rubric. Techniques from the sense-making might in be incorporated into the development of this rubric to ensure that the ne necessary voices and perspectives are integrated. Given the involvement of others, creating a rubric can be time-consuming. Also, the rubric is created that, that is created will be specific and unique to that context. So rubrics typically cannot be used between different projects without altering to fit the values and assumptions of that new project. Rubrics might also call into question, be called into question if project staff turn over and the new project staff bring different beliefs or values to the table. I believe this was acknowledged in the chat earlier to say, sometimes when project staff turn over, the users of your evaluation turn over, um, that can really kind of throw a wrench in some of this interpretation process. So making sure that people who are engaged can head that head up, head off some of those issues. So before our final question break, we, we want to pull this all together and put the various strategies we've discussed into action. So remember our friends from the beginning of the webinar? Well, let's take a closer look at their evaluation. So Helen is a faculty member at a community college in the United States. She has always been involved in an effort to update their classroom curriculum and lab activities. They want to make their manufacturing program more accessible and engaging to students by integrating new technology and offering virtual lab simulations. Their ultimate aim is to increase student retention, particularly with students who identify as Black or Latino AAX. In working with her evaluator, Jada, they have developed two primary evaluation questions. The first question, how effective is the new virtual simulation lab curriculum been in improving student retention? And the second question, how well did it work for students who identified as Black or Latino AAX? So let's start with this first evaluation question and walk through the strategies that we've been talking about. So after the data has been collected, we find that 58% of students remain enrolled in the program from last year to this year. So this is a strong data point, but to make it more interpretable, we want to surround it with other information. So let's look at the comparative data from the four sources we discussed earlier. Here's a segment of the grants logic model as found in their proposal to NSF. So it states that they hope that 70% of students remained enrolled after participating in the new curriculum. So our actual data point of 58 is a bit lower than that. However, like we already discussed, sometimes projects targets can often be optimistic and set a bit too high. So let's look at some other data points. Looking at retention rates across years, we see that 2021 saw a 45% retention rate and 2022 saw a 48% retention rate. After the new curriculum was implemented, we saw a 10% increase in student retention. So that seems promising, but let's look at some other information to build the constellation of our project story. Looking at similar academic programs in Helen's College, we see that the average student retention rate is 50%, a bit lower than our ATE project. We can also compare to student retention rates in other manufacturing programs nationwide. So it looks like nationwide, they actually have a higher student retention rate at 62%. So to recap, we started with our evaluation question about student retention. We collected information and we had this evaluation data point. 
Then we added information from our comparative data. We transformed this data point into a finding that states, student retention increased in the program by 10%. It remains higher than other programs in the college, but lower than other programs nationally. So this statement is more interpretable than the single data point alone, right? But how can we continue to improve this? Well, now that we have collected the stars in our constellation, we need to add meaning to tell the project story, right? We need to bring in those different values. And to do that, Helen and Jada pulled together their project and evaluation teams and invited some additional faculty from Helen's department to join the conversation. They laid out all of the evaluation findings, the data points collected through the evaluation, contextualized with the comparative data that we just discussed. And together, they talked about what they consider to be sufficient student retention. So through these discussions, they decided to make a rubric. So here you can see in this rubric, they've defined what not effective would look like, right? If it was below 45%, because 45% would actually be lower than previous years and lower than their college comparison. But on the other end, an extremely effective program would have student retention rates that are above 65%, which is actually surpassing the national average. So given this rubric, the current state of student retention rates of 58% would fall into that moderately effective category, allowing us to transform our previous finding into the conclusion that the new virtual lab simulations have been moderately effective in improving student retention. This kind of evaluation conclusion meaningfully and directly responds to the evaluation questions that we set out at the beginning. Okay, so now let's look at this second evaluation question, but this time I wanna hear from you. So stretch out your fingers and prepare to answer some questions in the chat window. So starting with this question, how well did the new curriculum work for students who identified as black or Latino AAX? The data was collected that shows the retention rates for students who identified as Black and Latino IAX was 35% compared to the 65% for students who identified as white. So if we wanted to take this data point to the next level, what kinds of comparative data would you look for to begin interpreting this data point? So you can answer this question in the chat box on the right side of your screen. So if you received this evaluation data point, what additional questions would you have? What kind of comparison data would you look for to begin interpreting this data point? Yeah, so we have someone says, has this disparity gotten better or worse? So looking at historical comparisons, what does this look like over time? What did it look like last year? Absolutely. What else might we want to look at? So Amanda says, is this the same for similar programs, right? So we can look at programs that are in within the college that Helen works at. We could also look at um, similar programs, manufacturing programs uh, nationwide or even statewide if we want to control for some factors. Claire says, how does this compare to other similar programs nationally? Right, yeah, so we can start looking at the number of um, community college students overall, right, who identify as Black and Latino IAX. Rebecca says baseline data within the college or national data set, right, so we can look at data sets like the um, Student Clearinghouse or the National Center for Education Statistics. We can talk to our um, institutional research office within the college to understand the data um, that comes from that community college. Anything else you might look at? Yeah, I think having all of those additional data points would really start to contextualize what this difference looked like. So now if we wanted to transform this statement again to arrive in a evaluative conclusion, who would you involve in a sense-making process? Who would you bring together to reflect on these evaluation findings? Whose values or perspectives or lenses would you wanna make sure are included? Yep. 
Yeah, so Kari says black and Latino IX students, right? Yeah, the students, I think that's really important. Um, you know, we can look at historical data and see an improved trend, but maybe that improved trend isn't good enough, right? Maybe that's not really the goal that we want to be setting for ourselves. Yeah, program participants. I agree, Leah. And of course, you know, I think maybe there's some assumptions here that the evaluation team and the project staff would be involved as well. Yeah. Yeah, Rebecca, I agree. Yeah, focus groups with Black and Latinx students. Well, thank you for, for walking through that example. Hi, this is Lissa. After the original presentation of this webinar, a colleague brought to our attention some concerns regarding this example, and I think their comments are important and need to be addressed. So I'm jumping in for a minute to add to the originally recorded content. The evaluation question listed in this example is not a good one. It oversimplifies and misrepresents the complexity of two very different racial, ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups. Combining the retention rates for Black and Latino IAX students into a single percent and then treating them as if they were a single group with a single experience did a disservice not only to the people in those communities, but to anyone who saw this example. Additionally, comparing this data point to a retention rate of white students furthers a false narrative that the white group should be used as the standard to measure against. I regret these mistakes. Instead, I wish I focused the question on Black students or Latino IAX students, chose a different comparison strategy, and talked about the complexity of only using a single data point measured in a certain way to address the potential impact on a systemic issue. Examples shared in webinars and other professional development trainings may need some paring down compared to how the evaluation might look in real life. However, that simplification should not do harm, misrepresent groups, or add to an existing falsehood. We apologize for not living up to our project's values in this example, and have built in additional checks for future webinars to share examples that embody high quality evaluation practices, which includes a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you for taking the time to watch our webinar. Now back to the original recording. I hope that really adds some, some meat to, to what we've been talking about today. But, you know, we, we've also been talking about interpretation kind of like it was a single step within the evaluation process, but that's not really true, right? All of the choices you make from the start of an evaluation bound that interpretation. The questions you choose to focus on, the indicators you decide to measure, the data you collect, all of these steps influence the final interpretation of evaluation findings. And while some evaluators find themselves coming into an evaluation in the middle of the cycle, we hope that um, for those of you that are there from the start, that you're really considering these interpretation strategies from the very beginning of your evaluation, when you're planning your evaluation. So no matter, ooh, no matter how you go about this process, here are just some final reminders. Um, so as we discussed, you want to make sure that you're thinking about how you're going to interpret data from the start. If you take away anything from today's webinar, we really hope that you remember that data points alone are less meaningful and that integrating comparative data and values to develop evaluation conclusions can tell a more comprehensive story. Your conclusions are strengthened by employing multiple strategies and considering multiple perspectives. And finally, make sure to be transparent about this process in your evaluation report. Justify your findings and conclusions with uh, backing up them with evidence and data, and then allowing others to follow along with how those judgments are made. Because just like constellations, evaluations have a great potential to tell stories and point the direction for project improvement. So I know we have a few minutes left. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and questions on this topic. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Samantha. Okay. If I 
So we do have one additional question and please feel free to put uh, additional questions in the chat. Um, the question is, can you actually interpret evaluation data collected if you don't have comparison data? Well, I wonder if the question should be, can you interpret evaluation data in a way that's justifiable and trustworthy from the consumers of the evaluation? Um, I think there are certainly ways that we interpret data, but that question is always going to be, how was that judgment reached and why was that judgment reached? And having that, those types of comparison data give you that backing, right? Give you those things to come back and say, well, here is why we decided that this was moderate or this was excellent. Thank you. And can you say more about using rubrics to weave quantitative and qualitative data? Is this related to the criteria? Some may be measured via quant and some qual and or something else that supports the interweaving. Yeah, Lisa, great question. So the example rubric that I showed a few slides ago, it was a very oversimplified rubric. Typically, you would find that the rubric would have multiple rows for those different criteria. Right, so some you may have um, a question around the retention rates, right, which are typically uh, measured quantitatively, right, but you may also have an evaluation question about belonging, right, and so that sense of belonging could be measured qualitatively. And so by defining qualitatively what it looks like at each of these levels for student belonging and what success looks like for the project, you're able to um, put both of those findings on the same scale in order to make a conclusion that combines both of those quantitative and qualitative data points. Okay, and where do you think that sense making most naturally comes in and what do you mean by having an interpretation strategy first? Yeah, so I'm actually going to start with the, the second question, right? So when we are making an evaluation plan, Typically, we, we think about the questions, we think about the kind of data that we're collecting, and we often think about how we're going to analyze that data, right? We're going to do descriptive statistics, or we're going to do some thematic coding analysis, right? But we also want to make sure at the start, we're thinking about how we're going to go that next step, how we're going to interpret those analyzed results, how we're going to go from findings um, to conclusions, right? And so if you want to take a strategy like the, the rubric, um, you want to make a rubric at the beginning of your evaluation, not after you have your findings, right? You want to make sure that you're doing that upfront. So that's what we mean by having an interpretation strategy upfront within your evaluation plan is thinking through how are you really going to make sense of that data? And in terms of the sense making, you know, I think that that's really this whole process. You know, there's there's not Megan and I went back and forth on this a lot, right? There's there's not this like step by step checklist we can tell you in order to make sense of your data. It really is this critical process of thinking evaluatively, questioning assumptions about the data, um, and and recognizing the values that those involved in the project bring to say what is good, what's good enough. Okay, thank you. And not a question, more a comment in the chat. I just wanted to draw attention to um, that a rubric uh, in their opinion gives some good interpretations. Um, just getting to know rubrics, but likes that it can weave to, uh, they like that they can weave together qualitative and quantitative indicators in one spot. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and that's it for our questions. So like we said before, this is certainly a topic that we don't have straightforward answers to right now, but we are thinking through. So we wanna think through with you, right? So reach out, connect to us. 
um, whether that's sending us a direct email, giving us a call, or connecting with us on LinkedIn, because this is a conversation, right? I think I quickly saw in the chat somewhere someone said, you know, this feels like a big weakness in the field to really strengthen our awareness, our knowledge, our research around this process, and we fully agree, and we want to do that with you all. And then finally, um, we do have a feedback survey. Uh, we do take um, all of your feedback of all of our events, particularly, particularly our webinars, very seriously. And so we want to hear from you. Um, what worked in this webinar? What didn't? What was good? What should we do again? What should we never do again? Um, all of those are welcome feedback. So we'll leave that link up. But thank you all so much for spending the past hour with us.